Hi, and welcome to the Red Tunic Podcast, a podcast where I look to rediscover what makes gaming fun and enjoyable by having positive conversations with those related to the industry. My name is Link, and today I'm joined by both Scott Slucher and Connor Quinn, who are currently working on a little gator game. Hi, Scott. Quinn, how are you guys doing today? Or Connor, oh, sorry. Oh, it's me, Quinn. You know me. You love me. You're looking forward to a little gator running around in a playground. I know it. Don't lie. Hello. <laughs> I'm also here. That's Scott. That's the lead developer of Little Gator Game. And I'm the I'm the art man, writing man, uh, colors man. <laughs> Uh, and for the, for correction, it it is Connor. I I made I missed I made a mistake there, but thank you for for running with it, uh, Mr. Art Man Color Man. You better believe it, Link. Thanks for having us on the podcast. <laughs> uh, you know I I'm very appreciative of both of you joining me for for uh, not only to be the first um, dual uh, interview setup that I've I've done, but also because you know I I played. A little gator game on one of your demos or one of the steam fests uh, a while back i think it might have been your first demo when you released it or the first one you released or what have you uh and you know it was an absolutely fantastic experience i um i really enjoyed it because it it kind of i shouldn't say kind of but it it really like encapsulated the idea of you know you playing with your friends as a kid in like you know uh, out at the playground or just like after school or on weekends or whatever, just at the park or, or wherever, and, you know, kind of just creating uh, adventures for yourself where it didn't really have to be grounded in any form of reality uh, or, or any form of actual danger. And I mean that in the sense of, like, with uh, Little Gator, the, the enemies, or at least the enemies presented in the demo, uh, and I'm going to presume it's going to be kind of similar uh, moving forward, um, but the, the enemies are just, like, cardboard boxes that you're just sort of taking down or cardboard standees or whatever um so you know yeah i'm really glad to have you guys both here it, it's you know uh the the game from where i played the demo is is absolutely fantastic and yeah just i'm happy to have you guys here thank you for joining me thank happy you so much here. happy to be the first the first tag team team on the red tunic uh, and hopefully hopefully it doesn't go horrible that i dissuade you guys from ever doing something like this again in the future dissuade from doing what thing from being a tag team team on the red tune being on a podcast <laughs> or creating a little gator game uh, well, let's go if i don't want to be the person that does anything to tank you guys working on a little gator game some more we'll go with that route that seems a little more uh, uh a little more appropriate <laughs> sure no um it, you mentioned the demo which was the only demo there, there's was, only been one it was the demo for the steam next fest of last year i think it was in november mm -hmm. or october there's a couple uh we, we were at indie land uh which had a, a area where you could sit and play some of the people's demos of their game and we we didn't have anything ready for that we weren't going to have anything ready for that so anytime that an opportunity has come up of, well, are we going to make a more updated demo? It's just, well, we're about to release the game. So, you know, maybe we talk about it after that, depending on what the marketing needs are. But uh, so far, the game's coming out in December. So that's pretty much the best demo you're ever going to get. And, you know, like I said, I, I absolutely enjoyed it. I, I, my significant other, they played it. She also enjoyed it. Um, you know, so I, yeah, I think it's probably the best demo that's even needed uh, to, to, to sell this game because I'm already on board and I, I imagine many others are as well just because, like I said, it's, uh, it's, it's, it does a wonderful job encapsulating the nonsensical nature of just trying to have fun after school or or whatever you know you can't expect more of that you can expect uh there's not a health bar there's no fall damage it is an experience entirely focused around the characters that you're meeting and the sort of uh adhd impulse that we collectively share as a development team to make number go up 
and make color appear. Uh, the you'll let me reset here. <laughs> So a lot of the enemies, all the enemies are, are going to be cardboard or some other crafting type of material. And it's all the, the something that is different from the demo. One of the things that made us decide to take it down was that uh, in addition to the demo, just the, the, the demo portion is still in the game, but it has a, a lot of different writing, new writing, a lot of different framing devices. And a couple of the new movement options that didn't exist in the demo, uh, including some of the, which you've seen in trailers, like climbing trees and tight ropes, those are, there's trees everywhere. So those are all over the tutorial area now and persist in different forms throughout the rest of the island. Yeah, we... we... We would have put up a new demo, but I mean, for one, with the Steam Next Fest stuff, they only let you be in one Next Fest, so it's a little bit not as important now. But then also, we've been really, we've been really buckling down to just get the game finished, and we haven't had a lot of time to budget for getting a demo all packed up together because it, it seems like just putting a demo together would be pretty easy, but it took us like a month to really get everything together and get everything like locked down and presented correctly. Yeah, because the Scott mentioned that he was kind of working on this on and off long before anybody else hopped on board. And a lot of that was just making the terrain of the entire island to where by the time we actually started populating it with stuff, it, there was sort of a framework of what could go where already and a couple of the skeletons of larger quests that were already sprawling out and occupying their certain area of the island so but when the demo for us was a lot of different things at once it was we're not only like writing content and and putting things places we also have to figure out what that's going to look like like what is the menu going to look like what are the characters going to be saying how do we want to pace everything um and once once we like crunched all that conceptual work in order to produce that snippet there was still a lot of work to do but now we were more able to follow a pattern and fall into our lanes and iterate the rest of the game from there yeah for to an extent um with the demo, up until putting the demo together, we we were sort of working on the game very... Uh, it was very all over the place, the development. Like, oh, let's spend some time mm -hmm. here and fix up this quest. Let's work on this quest over here. With the demo, we had to... It was... We had to do everything in that spot, get everything fully finished all at once, which no other place on the island, you know... <laughs> Look, speak peek behind the curtain. Nothing else in the rest of the game was to that point at all. At that point, um, so we had to nail down how quests were implemented correctly. We had to nail down the writing style one hundred percent. We had to uh, make sure that the mechanics were actually implemented well and felt good. Like. The demo was, to an extent, like a live test for the basic design framework of the game to see if people would actually... Because we didn't know going into it, like, this is kind of a weird game, right? Like, there's no combat. There are enemies, but they're not really enemies. They're most they're kind of, like, collectibles more than enemies, if anything. And I've sort of been... It's it's been a bit of a question in my mind throughout development whether people would even enjoy a game without combat. Oh boy, did they ever! <laughs> but the the demo was uh, something we also referenced internally um, for the rest of development in order to get the density of the quest givers. And how to lay out enemies. It was it was a very important 
stapling moment of productivity. And, you know, that's that's great to hear because, like, it's interesting to see kind of here behind that curtain about, um, I'm going to call it the panic uh, that would have, like, went into trying to actually prepare that snippet. And I've spoken with a few people that have, you know, um, their their game is just, you know, as far as it is right now, is kind of like a, a vertical slice or what have you. And it's always interesting to hear um, different sides of how that works. Uh, so thank you for that. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's amusing to me to hear like that. It's, you know, the, the, the kind of the panic that went into like, Oh, okay. And, you know, working towards it, but now kind of helped you guys find a, um, what I'm understanding as like a more consistent voice or a more consistent, um, idea. If what I'm saying actually makes any sense. I think yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, like coming out of the demo, like after we had the demo made, we then had like a consistent structure to put quests into. We had a consistent uh, sort of ideology behind what quests should be or how like decorations and breakables uh, should be placed throughout the environment. Um, like we had a much better idea of the pacing of the game and uh it also showed us how e it, we had some very clear feedback just watching people play the game because mm. for instance a lot of people would just follow the path immediately to the right and get the shield in the right in like the martin section of the island instead of immediately going to the quest that's right next to them with jill they just couldn't find the forest like like so, so, some people there's like jill it's it's in the magic forest and they were looking around and seeing trees everywhere and going i don't know which of these is the magic grove and that's how they ended up over there yeah so we 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 learned not to take for granted uh that players aren't going to just stick with a quest and just bash their heads against it if they don't know what they're gonna if they don't know what to do they're just gonna leave Uh, so we, we, it was great to have that feedback though, because we were able to go in and reshape the, the tutorial in a little, in sort of, I don't know that someone would notice the ways that we've shifted the tutorial around a little bit, like if they hadn't played the game or seen the game since the demo, but looking at them like side by side, you can see some little touches like, we put you some be able to tell visually it, it's it's a lot of like little dialogue changes and and uh, uh toys in a couple of places where they weren't before yeah and you know speaking to the differences of of that um personally as long as i can still ragdoll and roll around i i don't yes. think there'll be any there's issue. no danger of that um i'm not going to lie that was uh, possibly one of, and I, I can't, I can't explain why. So I'm just going to say on my part, it was one of the dumbest things I enjoyed doing, um, yeah. in a long time with, with games. And it's, you know, cause a lot of games, you know, a uh, uh, 3d platformer type games, you get to run around, you get to do things, but not a lot of them let you just push a button and be a dumb rag doll and just sort of like flop around and see if you can get some if you can get some air bouncing off a rock or um somehow slinking between the park bench and getting stuck and then having your character uh flop and fall as you try and pull them out of it um yeah that 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 speaks to sort of one of my earliest earliest goals for this project like way back to i've always wanted this to sort of feel like a big toy box of just silly things because I have a I have I don't have a lot of experience making full fledged games like the only other full game that I've made before this was like a congregate like web game that you can complete in like ten minutes and that's like my only actually 
like released game prior to this. Other than that, I just have a bunch of prototypes, a bunch of jam games. And I've always found playing those prototypes, those jam games, like going to game jams and playing the weird mechanics, the weird uh, uh, the weird toys that people have put together for these jams to be really enjoyable in a way. But you always look at those and you're like, well, this is fun, but this stupid mechanic wouldn't work in a full-fledged game. And I am over here and I'm like, but... What if I did it anyway? What if I put in the ability to ragdoll at any it's point? It's the kind of you... stuff that you try to do anyway. In any single player game, you're you're once you've you know lost focus on whatever you're doing, you're going around trying to goof with the geometry and like, oh, I wonder if this NPC reacts when I jump on them, right? And then you get so excited when they do. <laughs> so it's it's really cool, and there there's uh you know way more than just the ragdoll in the uh in the full experience in terms of uh goofy little ways to make gator transverse the environment yeah i i i devoted a lot of development time to making sure that there was sufficient moments like the ragdoll where you're like there's no way they put in the development time to have this as an implemented feature in the game right and the answer is we we did for better or worse. <laughs> so you know, I I will say to that that it you know in some of the older like some of the other games that do let you control a ragdoll, they're few and far between. Um, I can say from memory, I had more fun with Little Gators version or implementation than I did with something like um, any of the Saints Rose uh, insurance fraud or whatever whatever their mechanics were, where you actually got to do that. Um, or any of the other games that I just, I honestly can't remember. You could just ragdoll and it was, you know, you just ragdoll, right? Um, so um, I I appreciate, I think I and many other people um, who probably appreciate the work you did put in for, for ragdoll and any other kind of like movement mechanics. Because um, like I said, I legitimately spent a good solid 30 minutes just ragdolling <laughs> around like an idiot and having a whole, like laughing hysterically and having a blast just ragdolling around like a complete fool so um you know kind of to what connor said when you lose sight of the other things i'm probably just going to be losing sight as i ragdoll around mm -hmm. um or seeing if i can do something stupid like shield slide or sled or whatever and into a ragdoll or just something um so uh, thank you for the work you're putting into that, because I can promise you, at the very least, I appreciate it. I, I'm so glad that you do. There I hope is many a, others do as well. Uh, so far, so far, so good on that front. So far, so good. We 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 played it. We had uh, they were playing it at Indie Land uh, while we were there, and pretty much the whole time. <laughs> The, the person playing it just kept ragdolling at every opportunity possible. <laughs> I'm happy to hear it. That I'm just so happy to hear that. That it's it's that the the mechanic is paying off, you know? It's uh there's there's a certain gameness to lack of control, right? Or, uh, because you want to win in a situation that wasn't designed for you to win, right? That's why people like boundary breaking and discovering weird unintended mechanics in games. And uh, I, I think that's part of why the ragdoll is so fun is because you, at, at any, you get to decide the rules of at any point you choose, you can't move normally anymore. And you, you're sort of inventing this game that clearly wasn't designed for you to win. And you can bail at any time you want, and you can succeed at any level that you want. And I think that's what makes it so exciting. So I think that really speaks to... Uh 
speaks to what you said, Scott, about the game feeling like a toy box. I was going to make the comparison that it feels like a sandbox in that, you know, you have all this yeah. stuff and you can just do whatever. And Connor, the way you put that in the, uh, that you can like just make your own rules and all that, it, it all kind of ties back to, you know, that just being like that going back to just in the, the, the view or the instilling that this is just a childhood game, like that it's, it's very close to what you actually would have did as a child. Um, I don't want to say, you know, it's just Calvin Ball rules, but like the introduction of certain mechanics kind of does make it make Calvin Ball rules just for you, right? That is, um, uh, hmm. There's, there's a couple different things that are running through my head. And I think I, I'd want to start with prompting Scott by saying that's that what Link just said reminds me of what the reason you put climbing in like the climb meter do you remember that do you remember what yeah you told me? that uh yeah because we have a mechanic in the game which is that you're able to climb and it uses essentially a stamina meter it's like the same as something like breath of the wild and while for the most part we have kind of eschewed um, sorry, that's my phone. I'll turn it off. I'll I mean, go I back. Did the same thing. Um, how far back do you want me to go? Uh, you, as you far said, as you want. Oh, you're talking to Connor. Sorry. I you link. Just just, just keep talking. Just keep talking like <laughs> you didn't stop. This is all in in hell now. It's all in <laughs> hell. Drag us out of it. It's kind of like Breath of the Wild. Uh, Breath of the Wild has a climbing feature that uses stamina, and while, for the most part, we've removed a lot of the stuff that you would associate with something like stamina. And, um, you know, health and, and danger in a lot of ways. Yeah, like all those things that you would typically associate with some sort of game mechanic f stopping you from being able to do something. I felt pretty strongly, both intuitively and also just from playing the game, that you still need a little bit of resistance so that it actually still feels like a game. Uh, like, if you can climb anywhere you want from the get-go, it's, it's less interesting that way, right? Like, even though we are going for a game that is very freeing, that is very without consequence, that is very easy. <laughs> um, it's still a game about growth, you know, down to its narrative core. Yeah, and so being able to climb the walls a little bit further as you collect the bracelets, because... There's a bracelet in the demo. There's, should I say how many more bracelets there are? Not how many, just that there's more. <laughs> there's more bracelets for you to collect throughout the rest of the island. And it's sort of a marker for growth that lets you explore the island a little bit easier every time. Um, and sort of, in a sense, like turns it more into a sandbox. Uh, as those restrictions get lifted a little bit at a time. Also, if you're listening and you're like, ah, oh, how am I going to know how many bracelets? You'll know when you get the last one. <laughs> well, that's, and that's always good to know because um, <clears throat> from a, from a completionist standpoint, knowing that you're done is always fantastic. You know, um, even if it's like an in-game kind of, uh, reference to let you know or an actual what have you um you know countdown um knowing you have all of something is is fantastic i i uh one of the things i always hated about older games is you kind of just hoped you had it all <laughs> right you hoped yeah, you had yeah. found all the secrets and then you got to like some games like donkey kong country 2 and 3 where the and even one i think i don't remember but like that 100% 
went to like 112 percent so like oh you, you never knew so you know it's always nice when the game lets you know oh, 12 12 what a weird what a weird end cap that's so silly uh, i don't i don't know for certain if that was like the number but they went past like 100 um mm -hmm. and it's it's always just been a pet peeve of mine it's like well numbers mean nothing now thank you yeah i'm i'm personally pretty strongly a completionist archetype when I play games, so I've I've put in some stuff for that. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, what well, th this is a go ahead. It's finished. Um, it it may seem like like the game keeps track of like the number of friends that you've made throughout the island, and it also keeps track of all of those little breakables that you break throughout the whole <laughs> island. Uh, which sounds awful to 100%, but we have, we've put in some stuff to actually make it pretty attainable and fairly, I find it fairly rewarding to pick up those last few breakables because by, by, by searching for them and finding them, you're finding little, tiny little corners of the island that you hadn't touched previously that you weren't really aware of and you're, and you're seeing just all these that's that's the that's the part of the of completing a game that I always find the most interesting is that like just going through a game and just 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 going organically and just find just just playing through the game as it expects you to and just doing stuff as you go you miss a ton of little weird corners that the developers had to put so much time and effort into and by going back and finding those corners again you're like what i had no idea this was here why are there three barrels stacked on top of each other in this one corner of like forsaken fortress or something you know it, it it's a very boring example but <laughs> <laughs> three barrels <laughs> But you know God, what I mean. I like, can barely lift the one. Like, uh, it's these huge worlds. Like, like Twilight Princess has a bunch of these, where there's just caves. Where if you just play through the game normally without going crazy with the side quests, you would never find them. Or if you found them, you would go into them and do them a little bit, and then turn around and leave when you ran out of torch uh, juice. Um, but if you're going through and trying to get everything, you're like, oh, it's this cave. And then you go through and you're like, oh, it keeps going. And you it, and these caves just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. And you're like, I had no idea this was here. I would have never come back here if I wasn't trying to actually collect all of this stuff. There's an obvious example of that, too, which is uh, Elden Ring. I, sure. you know. I'm sure everyone's heard this, but I, I played that video game, and the first time that I went through, I got nearly all the way to the Tornado Island, and I had never met Ronnie, still have never met Patches, um, didn't know about the guy at the Rose Cathedral, didn't know about... Uh, it, it, it took me getting to the Altus Plateau before somebody looked at my map and said, you haven't done the other half of Limgrave of the starting area. And and I, I beat the game without <laughs> doing a lot of that stuff. So, like, more than half of the... And, I mean, that's... Of course, this is an extreme example. Elden Ring is, is like, a three quadrillion dollar masterpiece. But uh, Scott's example proves that it holds to games of many scales. Referring to a Zelda game as a smaller game is a very concerning. Twilight Princess is smaller than Elden Ring. That's all I'm saying. It's saying. smaller than Elden Ring, but it's still a pretty big <laughs> okay, game. Okay, well then let me at least sit here for another 20 minutes and I'll think of one that's even smaller than that. <laughs> um, okay, I, I literally just thought of an example. Didn't even have to. Uh, it's an old game. It's an oldie but a goodie. Ages uh, four to eight or whatever. Pajama Sam. Uh Pajama sure. Sam is an incredibly small video game. It's a point-and-click adventure. 
very different than lots of other types of video games. But there is so like there are things to click on everywhere. So if you you can scour every single screen. The other day I was playing it with my friends, just going through it for fun, showing them like, ah, this was a cool thing that has remained cool. And they clicked on things that I had never known did anything. And I saw animations, you know, after having played this like a hundred times when I was young, I'd seen animations that I had never seen before. And there's a there's like a whole YouTube video I watched about this one hallway that has these three candlesticks in it. And they have different dialogue combinations depending on which order you click on them. All, all, all sorts of little stuff. Oh, and there there was something I wanted to mention as well. This is a this is like if you're if you're listening to this podcast and you're trying to be a game developer and with all your lofty dreams and whatnot, this is for you. Our team is three, like basically three strong, and and we get outside help every once in a while. And Robin uh, is very sweet and doesn't uh, really push in on many of the debates so really the debates come down to me and scott and we still have them all of the time about many many different things uh one of those things to loop back around to what we were talking about earlier one of those things was the topic of completion about um how completion fits into the the narrative world like who's who's giving you the ability to finish this game in a narrative sense and uh we really got into it on the topic of achievements on like what was achievable and and what was worth risking having to start a new save file for or something like oh. that turned out nothing but uh <laughs> the other day i got a twitter dm from someone whose name I can't quite remember, but their their tag was effectively completionist their name, like com com completionist grace or something like that. And they they came to me with that question, like, hey, listen, just give me like obviously you can tell my shtick, just give me a heads up. Is there anything in this game that I'm going to have to start a new save file in order to get? And I was proudly able to say, like, nope, we that that was something Scott was very adamant about. Uh, and you'll be able to do it all in one run, even if it's just something that you don't think about until you've already done everything. I have very strong thoughts about achievements. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've um, heard them all. I'm, I'm happy to hear that that was like an actual forethought. And, you know, that does kind of lead into um, another question uh, or a question that I had wanted to ask. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, kind of, you know, usually I ask, you know, one person how they got into developing games. However, um, in this case, I have you both here. So I'm going to ask, how did you guys come together to start working on a little Gator game? Well, uh, at first it was just me making the game by myself like at first it was i there was a prototype that i made in december of 2019 just by myself in around a month uh the game is pretty unrecognizable but all the little seeds were still there like you were playing as little gator you had big sis trying to convince her to play the game with you and there was a playground and some of the characters were there. The elephant <laughs> the, was there, the monkey was there. Elephant, monkey, the llama was there. The uh -huh. raccoon, the trash raccoon was actually there in that earliest version. But And he gave you I, moon shoes. But then after that, uh COVID happened and we're, I I I wish I could say that I took that as an opportunity to just buckle down and use all my free time, but I think like all of us, I kind of lost motivation from being stuck inside all the time. 
So development kind of waned for a little bit, but after a few months, I really picked back up the development. And I think at that point, my partner Robin joined the team to help with 3D modeling and music, and also helping run the social media. And then very soon after uh, he started running the social media, uh, we 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 realized we needed help with that as well. And that's partially how Connor got into the picture. Like we had consulted Connor previously with like color theory. He had made the logo for the game um and just general art advice but i think the the actual impetus of you joining the team was because we needed someone who could who had the free time and capacity to actually like run the social media stuff and then later Correct me if I'm wrong, it was kind of after the fact that we were like, oh, and you can also help us with art and writing and character design and the audit. And then the list just started going, like extending and extending. It extended because I wanted to do things. Because when I, when I first came in, uh, I was happy to help just be a, just be someone who responded to messages and also uh very early on i i I mean i i knew these guys so it took a little convincing of like do we need another team member but once i was on board we all knew each other and and trusted each other and stuff like that so like the next day i was in a meeting with a potential publisher uh taking notes and absorbing all that sort of stuff so i I did that. I, I helped make um like keep notes and and correspond with publishers as well as fans. And then you know You know what? Hang on, I'm kind of drawing a blank. And just kind of ballooned out from there, maybe. It a lot of what I ended up doing on the final project of the game was me trying to take things off of Scott's plate. Because Scott, as he mentioned, started out the game and and had very strong opinions about the characters and and how things were meant to progress. And that sort of... uh, Which which happens a lot when you're creative. It, It sort of ends up forcing you to do things that you don't want to do, that you're not good at, and that you don't really care to get good at because you have so many other things that you're worried about. Um, so at first, that was, uh, well, the, these there, there needed to be character models, and I was like, I I know art. Let me help you make the character models. Keyword help. But I I, I know art, so I picked no, up no. Art. I think it was the UI. I think the UI might have been the first thing that you worked on. That sounds right. It's like, yeah, we we th- this thing needs to happen, and you're the guy with the most experience. So, I I took care of it, and then the next thing needed to happen, and Scott was programming, and Robin was making music and and doing architecture. So I was like, I'll take care of that, and. Uh, then it was writing, you know, a, a lot of Scott's writing was like, uh, was like technical writing and, and placeholder stuff. So I jumped in and started writing the quests. And eventually it got to the point where I was no longer um, creating assets to fill empty space, but creating new assets. And at at that point, I mean, I I felt like the artist and writer long before that. But at that point, it was pretty clear that I was the artist and writer because I was doing all the art and writing. And uh, along alongside the UI, um, which was for the for the. uh, What's it called for the demo, 
that was the item screen, the the little notebook. And at the time, we had only had the slime hat, the stick, the wooden sword, the shield, and the teddy bear, the ragdoll. And at at that moment, I decided like I I can do, you know, because also we were looking back and forth between other games that inspired us like okay well how did they do this how did they do this what should this look like what would what looks good to us out of the games that we like and i was like i'm gonna we can't just have these be the 3d models on the page i'm gonna have to make images of all these items and so before we even knew what half of the catalog of items was i i had set in stone that we were i was going to uh make all of the images for those uh and was very confident in myself that yeah yeah connor's initial images were very detailed and i was like connor you're going to kill yourself don't i only brought it back a little bit (laughs) i'm very powerful none of you test me so from what i'm really hearing here connor is that you were you were Sam to to his to Scott's throat. <laughs> Sam food. Sorry. Samwise. Thank you. You Scott. guys are you guys can kill me if you want, but I really don't know anything about Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I'm, uh, if I am interpreting your meaning correctly, you're saying that Scott found the magic ring and <laughs> I came along to help out on the adventure and ended up being the super cool, amazing one that everyone wants to kiss on the forehead. Yes, that's exactly what he's going for. Beautiful. <laughs> then, uh, yes, that's accurate. Scott, I'm happy that that reference wasn't lost on you at the very least. Lost? Like, they got lost in the mountain of Stop. gold? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you thought I didn't know anything. <laughs> So thank you for explaining how you guys like how how you came to be working on Little Gator together. Um, it's it's always interesting to hear kind of like how the team fills out because you know usually when I talk to someone it's just hearing their approach or how they like started things and hearing um, the the multiple the multiple roles being filled and how and why they need to be filled is really interesting because uh, you know a lot of people um, they'll see like an indie project and you know they don't they don't really put that kind of thought into it because they you know un- until you're sitting right there trying to have to flesh everything out um you know you don't really have the experience or the idea for it so thank you for explaining that that's really interesting to to hear it all kind of yeah. fall out i or, sorry the pieces make... fall in not out they 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 were they all fall into place like a like a tower of cards collapsing back into a deck <laughs> I have wanted to make video games since I had an idea of what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, there's, a, there's a little story behind that, but I, I've always known that that's what I was going to do. And I've been building worlds and, and doodling characters and all that stuff since I was little. So, uh, and, and uh, closer to when I hopped on board with gator game i was actually approaching indie devs and asking for a job and and seeing what i could do and so i'm i'm always going to be very grateful to scott for uh needing someone to fill a role and for letting me be the person who filled that role and i feel a lot more confident as a developer now it's so weird that you were looking at all these other indie games and you didn't come to me first thing. <laughs> that that's that's the thing. Um it, it, the the nature it, it it was just it was just a very bizarre storybook sort of timing thing because I I kind of felt like you guys were were okay. You know, I I didn't know very much about the industry or or where I could fit in or uh, or it, that you were even working on something that would require my my talents 
You know what I mean? And it, the see, definitely seeing it on, seeing it, like seeing the character move and seeing how big the world was that you were building, uh, definitely gave me, you know, some ideas that uh, that a, a sort of a smaller closed world, like the stuff that you had been posting before, uh, it was like, oh yeah, it seems like like you said, seems like a, a fun uh, little mechanic. Seems like a, a very lovely closed experience. Uh, I, I can certainly point out places that I could help, uh, but it was it was very cool to enter a space that needed me and uh, figure out how to be useful there. Yeah, I think the thing that Connor helped the most with, in my mind, like in a pinch, we could have done the modeling ourselves in a pinch we could have done the social media ourselves in a pinch we could have done the ui ourselves we could have it wouldn't have looked great but we could have but i think i think the thing that i didn't take into account when we brought connor onto the team that has helped the most is connor's help with the writing because after a certain point connor kind of just fully took the reins on writing the game. I don't know why I, I decided to make a game with so much dialogue in it when I'm not a good <laughs> writer. It's not the smartest decision I've ever made in the world. It's the standard uh, creative curse is that you, I've, I'm having, I'm actually putting together a D and D setting uh right now or or extrapolating on the one that you played in scott and boy do i just not like politics i, I just i don't really care about the deeper intricacies of what the kings are doing or or, or how the two nations feel about each other and that's kind of important when you're making a story about crossing a continent and and finding artifacts that tie into that stuff it, to making people feel invested in the world uh you, you can lean into what you're good at so far and then y y you've either got to concede to it not being the best thing it could be or but I, either way you got to do the thing I don't know if there was a second half of that analogy now that I finally got here. <laughs> and thus is the creative's curse. Sometimes you got to get started and not really know where the heck you're going to end up and then fill in the blanks once you get there. Like I just did in that run on sentence. So, you know, yes, I think many people can definitely relate to the creative's curse in some way, shape or form and can probably relate to what you just said, you know, that you immediately get in over your head and, you know, no offense to anyone in call or in general. Um, but like sometimes when you get in over your head, you realize, oh, I don't know how to swim. And it's always nice when in those moments, someone is either there to tag you out so you don't have to swim anymore or they're able to throw you a lifeline. Right. So I brought you know, the floaties and they had 300 <laughs> lines of dialogue on them. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I think many people understand where you, what your analogy was getting to and probably have experienced it before. So it's always, I, you know. I, I had the same, I had the same problem on my previous game as well. I made this really, this really small web game called Zack. You can still Z find it on Newgrounds, by the way. You can pause this podcast and go play it right now. <laughs> is this, I think it's on Congregate is where it got the most traffic. Both. Um, but Your preferred medium. It was this, it's this small side-scroller that's very inspired by um, Shovel Knight. Z-A-K, by the way, if you're searching for it. <laughs> and it's this very tightly designed little thing where it's just a little platformer side scroller with like very specific enemy placements, very specific jump 
very specific like weapon. You only have a melee weapon, so everything is sort of designed around that. But I got I got part of the way into it, and I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know how to do level design. I don't know anything about level design, and I kind of hate doing level design. And in that case, I just muddled through it. And I even, I was even working on a sequel to that game for a while. Like, I think over a year I was working on a sequel to that game. And I had the same exact issue. I just was awful at level design. I mean, not awful. Like, I think the, I'm proud of the game that I put out with Zach. And I think I'm proud of the level design that I, that I put into the sequel as well, but it just drained the soul out of me doing this thing that I really didn't like doing and I knew had to be done and had to be done well or else there's no point in the game existing because that's the whole game. And it's kind of the same with Gator Game. Like I'm thankfully Gator Game didn't fall into that same whole and i attribute a lot of that to connor taking the reins uh on the writing front uh connor we've alluded to connor having a background in like being a dungeon master and i can't think of a better background for doing games writing because it's more or less the same thing uh just writing dialogue writing characters, doing character designs, and figuring out what this character and what are they going to say and what's their whole deal. Link, how often in the show do you get into the general idea that making a video game, along, it's like especially a video game, which is something you have to produce in a physical medium on like D&D and DMing and stuff like that, is 10,000 different jobs in a trench coat that you know three people have to do you you know it's been it has been gently um uh it has been gently suggested it has been um kind of directly discussed but it's it's never never goes a little like it, how do i put it um it typically doesn't go to the nitty gritty and i'm not meaning that in a bad way i just mean usually it's kind of just said and you know it's something to oh, okay be aware of this um usually a picture is not painted when when that road is taken i think that's the 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 best way to put it because you know i don't mean to say that in a way that would be um disparaging or offensive or 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 discrediting or whatever to anyone i've spoken to before um just usually a picture isn't painted when it comes down to talking about all of those uh all of the things that you you generally don't think of and you know i can i can say as like a as a programmer that i've had that has had to look into you know doing projects or whatever that you know sitting down and sometimes like going oh, okay and setting up like the big map of okay this needs to exist this needs to exist and all of that um and i think anyone that has done that as well can really emphasize with going oh crap there is a lot of stuff that I need to do. And some of those tasks are, as you guys have learned, probably very straightforward and can be very simple. And you're like, oh yeah, I can bang that out. And then you get into another part of the task and you're like, oh, well, how do, like physics, for example, like, well, how do I ensure that the physics interactions are always going to work and I'm not going to clip through this rock and then shoot off into space or, or what have you, right? And sometimes in Gator Game, I think if you do hit a rock in the wrong way, you could shoot off into space or clip through the <laughs> ground. Uh, sometimes the best you can do is just expect that situation to happen somehow and just put in a little failsafe for it and just call it a day and just not spend your all of your time trying to focus on this one tiny aspect of the game we all you... have our sorry go ahead no no please okay. we all have our our like one or two word titles that we put in you know when uh 
when someone's introducing us on a show or when we're putting something in the credits, we usually call Scott the lead dev. Scott is a programmer, a technical artist, a technical writer, uh, like our terrain person who who did most of the modeling of the island, uh, our like technical terrain person who does things like uh, bring players' attention to which water is shallow based on like the plants you see there. Uh, it was Scott who pretty much uh, decided what. But there's, by the way, there's more monsters in the main game than there are in the demo island, and they sort of uh, have their biomes that they live in. Uh, so that that was Scott. W- that that's just like kind of a taste of what a one-word title actually looks like under the hood. I I think I. I think if unless I'm forgetting something, I think I'm involved in every single aspect of the game, probably including the music. Yeah, R- Robin and I aren't uh, aren't uh, big on Unity, but I've I've dipped my hands into pretty much anything that doesn't involve coding, and then I spill over into uh, taking care of like the new social media stuff and the the. We have a Patreon that is going to be like a community hub pretty soon. And uh, and Ro- Robin is like, oh, yeah, Robin's the composer who also happens to have modeled like half of the props in the game and did a lot of work to make sure the playground structures look nice and knows stuff about Unity. In vo- like, there's the side of Unity, the, uh, the side of what's it called the side of blender that i mess with which is making cute little animal characters and then there's the math side of blender where there's a keystroke that perfectly uh, parallels these objects and and puts a hole the size you want it to be in this part of it uh that i just haven't even bothered with yeah i had to learn python so that i could run stuff in blender that's another thing I had to do. I had never touched Python before. I've never I touched even know... Python, but I have come in contact with a black racer. I didn't even know that Blender had Python in it. But, yeah, I've... So that's, even... that's just me. I also want to say that's not to... Uh, the The obligatory, that's not to discourage anybody listening from starting you do have to start but just to for anybody who's maybe out there like oh man why didn't they do this on this game you know how how come this isn't what i expected it to be just exactly what it is that you're uh criticizing and you know i think that is a very important thing as well because a lot of people you know, myself included, and I'm sure both of you in the past uh, have probably played some games and been like, well, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? And, you know, as you, especially people that get into development, um, not for, you know, just in development in general and whatnot, um, or just people that get into making games quickly realize, oh, that's that's probably why. They had pillars they needed to stand on. Or um, what they were working on doing, like, that's just how they had to make it work. And so, you know, it's it's always good to have that perspective said out loud for people because, you know, a lot of people just think it's it's magic that, you know, um, I spoke I spoke with one one guest previously and they thought like the games just made themselves as when they were children. And that's, you know, it's I think a lot of people just have that that mentality of the magic of, oh, yeah, it's just a thing that happens. You know, you just have to have an idea and then you push a few buttons and then, you know, being told the realities of it, um, I think helps to I don't want to say humanize because we're all humans, but it kind of like (laughs) it kind of like gives the 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 the. Oh, screw it, I'm going to say humanize. It kind of humanizes the process to know that someone is doing that, that there is a breathing, living human being that has to put forth, you know, themselves, especially as a cre- if you're a creative, um, you're putting yourself really into it to put it out there. So, 
you know, it's all, I think it's always important to keep that in mind. And it's very nice and good to have that said out loud. Um, now I do want to ask both of you a question. Um, and you know, this kind of goes back to you, you two as, as people, as humans. Um, but I'm quite certain that there has to have been a game for, for, both of you, I don't. I don't assume it would be the same one. If it is, that would be a wild thing. But I have to assume that both of you had a video game that you played when you were younger, or maybe not when you were that much younger. That you stepped back and said, "This is what I want to do in life." You know, um, was there? You know, for for the two of you, uh, whatever one, whichever whomever wants to start first. But you know, what game was it for you that made that you played and went, "This is what I want to do. This is the thing that's." I need to do in life now. I pick whatever Scott picks. <laughs> no, I'm joshing. Go ahead. Um, it's weird because I, I've long had the interest in making games. Like in high school, I was programming a really basic game on my TI eighty three calculator. Uh, through college, I was making tiny little prototypes to, on the side, but the game that, like, it wasn't a game from my childhood. The game that actually got me to be like, oh, I can make a game right now was actually playing Shovel Knight when I was, like, like three years, no, when, in, like, 2016. When I was like 20, 24 or 25 or something. Uh, it was not even the base Shovel Knight. It was Shovel Knight Spectre of Torment. I played that and the levels were so clearly, cleanly designed. The movement was so interesting. And you could, to some degree, see how the game was made. You could you could feel the developer's hands on the game as you were playing it. Like to some degree a game like that to me feels like some sort of like it feels like you're having a conversation with the developers by playing the game, by experiencing the interesting decisions that they made along the course of development and playing that and feeling that was the thing that got me to that that showed me like oh i could make a game like this a really simple game much simpler than this but i could just make a game right now and so i that's what started me working on zach that's oh wait <laughs> that's cool it, i i say to scott that's cool because i'm currently uh 26 so it, it's it's interesting to imagine not having decided to <laughs> to make games yet because my uh, my inspiration did come much much earlier it uh I went to a doctor's office for my ADD when I was very young. And he was sort of like an experimental guy. So they were just, or at least I was, just learning about the idea of hand-eye coordination. And they thought that hand-eye coordination might um, be related to whatever I had going on. And as a result, in his lobby, waiting to be seen there was a game boy advance not not an SP, it was just a game boy advance and it or maybe an sp and it had in it a cartridge of kirby's nightmare in dreamland now up until that point i had played as i mentioned pajama sam freddy fish putt putt i had this uh this zelda themed typing game which is burned into my memory i can i can see this like evil little screen that had the guys that come up out of the sand and have spikes on them and uh how much i hated 
hated trying to escape those guys. They were awful. But those were all just like the, the you mentioned like uh, they disappeared. Yeah, those were just computer games. Those were just those were really cool things that I enjoyed. But Kirby was something else, man. You you had jumps and you had abilities that you could take from people. And my my little creative brain went crazy thinking of all the different abilities you could have. And what if you combined abilities and stuff like that? And that's maybe the first time that I got into what I do anytime I play a video game now or watch a movie or do anything, which is, this is awesome. What would I have done? What could, what could make this experience even cooler? And so my, I came into it from a design standpoint where for the next year and a half, all of my notebooks, any pad of paper I could get my hands on had sketches of my character that could copy enemies' abilities and what I thought a fire guy would look like and what I thought an ice guy would look like. And I'm looking back on them now, they're just blatant copyright infringement. But that <laughs> that spirit of creation never left me. So when I was in middle school and they were like, think about what kind of stuff you want to do they're like 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 a career aptitude type of situation and they went down the list and one of the things was computer something or other i don't even remember what they called it back then but i was like y you can do that yes that 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 and they were like oh well you probably want to talk to a guy yeah just as long as they tell me how to do that and that phrase that might I add that misguided phrase that does not mean the same thing from school to school so much so that I refuse to speak it in the unfortunate circumstance that I misguide yet another generation. But whatever that meant, I thought meant video games, making video games. And I would repeat it to every guidance counselor I ever talked to after that, try to find the classes that would lead me closer to that. Um, I ended up getting a lot of ancillary skills that were useful later when all conjoined together. But uh, I got pretty darned lucky that I had a friend who was meanwhile coding for fun. Me. Yeah. <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, thank you for sharing that. It's very... It's interesting for both of you in, in, in for different for different reasons. Scott, for you, it's it's interesting because you know um, Shovel Knights. You know, it, you were it was later in your life that you you played a game that went, oh, this is what I want to do, and that's you know I think that's really really neat. And you know, Shovel Knight's a fantastic game, and I think the way you described it, um, like it was the developer having a conversation with you. I think that was a really interesting way to do it because. Well, I wouldn't use those same words. I would say it's a very similar feeling that I had when I first played Shovel Knight in that uh, for me, it was very obvious, you know, where their inspiration was from and getting to play Shovel Knight. And I, I, I played the, some of the expansions. I need to go back to them um, and actually like complete them. But when I played the, the base Shovel Knight, for me, it was reminding me of you know, all of the games that I enjoyed when I was a child, all of the games that it drew inspiration from. So, you know, I I get like I 100 percent understand what you're saying. And I think it's just interesting that that is the game, you know, so so further, much further in your life um, that that was like the yeah, this is what I'm going to do. And for, for you, Connor, it's the, the thing that interests me the most um, you know, not the fact that it was Kirby and that it led to, you know, just nothing but copyright infringement on your part. Because, um, you know, Kirby is a fantastic game. Not to discredit Kirby. I I have a... Um, I don't understand my obsession with it, but I absolutely love Kirby. Um, I I've can't... got two Kirby plushes, a yo-yo and a hammer guy, just to the left of me on my printer right this very instant. Can And you can't explain why you like it so much, right? It's just Kirby, right? It's just, you know, a stupid pink ball with a smile and just makes you feel good. Um... I actually have a disease where I can tell you in great detail why I like everything in my life. But <laughs> that said fact aside, please continue. Um, but the thing that interested me the most or, or amused me the most about that 
was you just there's just a game boy sitting at the doctor's office that just yeah what like what the heck it, it, it what a trusting man right <laughs> and i didn't go i forgot to mention this but like i had in in my pursuits as a creative and because i was such like a confident kid uh, and a loud kid i i had you know the support of of my family in a lot of what i did uh and i'm thankful for that and so when i when i said like hey can i have that can can i can i because every time i would go back you know the file would be erased and and i could never actually make any progress and so I asked for a, a Game Boy Advance. I, I had an, a Game Boy Advance SP, which my uncle got me. And then later when the DS Lite came out, he gave me his old DS and I got to start getting into those types of games. But yeah, the it, it almost, looking back on it, feels like, a, feels like a Narnia type artifact that was planted there in order to seed the game developer that would come later but it that was a a magical object in my hands that that spirited me into a new world and as cheesy as that sounds it's it's the closest thing to true that i think i've ever said about it so you know thank you for for sharing that and um yeah it's like it's it is really interesting you know just the the general idea of kind of like that uh you know we always see it in movies it's always like you said that like that narnie moment or just like the 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 cliche kind of what have you or like the beam of light just incident sorry the 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 inciting incident the the moment before the call to adventure when uh when the hero chooses whether to resist the call or take up arms yeah 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 the um oh, the hero's journey there we go that's the that's the word i was looking for but you know like the the spotlight that kind of indicates the turning tide for the hero actually um actually agreeing to it actually accepting you know well okay this is my life now um you know sometimes the hero's journey as a weird aside sometimes the hero hero's journey takes like several nonsensical um amounts of time I shouldn't say nonsense, but I was thinking a wheel of time and how that took like three, four books before, before, mm-hmm. you know, he actually says, I'm going to do it anyway. Sorry. I got a um, recommendation for that series recently. Oh, uh, well, you know, um, as an aside, I, I was listening Well, before the pandemic, I was listening to, to the auto audio books. Um, fantastically read by the way, to the, the two, the two people that are, are doing them. Absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, I need to get back to it because for whatever reason, um, and Scott, you might, you might, I think both of you might, but Scott, you kind of touched on something akin to this um, about working on the game and then the pandemic kind of just throwing everything to the, to the woods. Um, for me, I stopped being able to like listen to things while working from home just because it doesn't work for me. It's not as easy anymore as in the office for whatever reason. So I need to get back to them. Can and I, I encourage you two Connors and you Scott as well, Scott, if you haven't, because you know they're absolutely fantastic from, from I what the, I've been told. Uh, the Amazon show actually. There are words that could be said about uh, about about that. Um it was alright. It was recommended <laughs> to me because um what I'm doing right now in my for my D and D players is they're going to be like students at a magical school. And so I was asking around, seeing if people had any, any like source, good source material for that. And someone who plays D anD D and understands the uh, the intricacies of different fantasy genres suggested The Magicians, which was a very good book. Had stuff that I'm going to be stealing from directly, no salt because I know that my players haven't read it. But um, someone who just kind of knows that fantasy is fantasy suggested wheel of time and it's like yeah this is in a fantasy world you got that part right the uh i don't know if there's anything else i'll be borrowing from it though you know i i don't know if the i sedized methods for for teaching would be um as conducive to what anyone would be aiming for if they were trying to have a magician school i did i am going to steal one thing from that 
I love the idea that every ma magician of a certain status level has like a uh, a single bodyguard with whom they share a bond greater than husband and wife. That's like I I, I can't wait to describe like a, a, a archmage walking by with a like a sullen looking right hand. Uh, that stares at the players in an intimidating way and them learning about that relationship. You, you know, and that's, that is like an, a really interesting thing about Wheel of Time as well, uh, just the whole warder system and the different colors and how all that interacts. I'm not going to get into it because my memory's not too great and also because sure. I don't want to drag us down with that. You said, you said this is going to be like a, a sidebar and now we're getting back into the interview. Uh, well, kind of, yeah, yeah. Trying to pull it back, um, pull it back for for uh, something a little more specific to the things, not uh, not going off on a, a tangent about well, unless you want to, but not going off on a tangent about um the magical intricacies and systems or what have you of different fantasy settings. I could talk about that longer than an hour podcast, so yeah, you probably should. <laughs> um, so. I am curious for both of you, because I don't want to take up too much more of your time. However, I am curious. Um, outside of games, outside of making games, or outside of playing games, or what have you, um, you know, Connor, I, I, I suspect yours might be D&D &D related, which is absolutely fine. Um, even if, and it's also absolutely fine if the answer is, go video games, because sometimes it's just video games. But outside of games, what other kind of hobbies do you guys have and enjoy? I really wish I had an answer other than just video games. <laughs> I I don't. I I'm I've been very I've had a very singular focus my whole life, which has just been video games. Uh it's a bit of a problem since I've gotten into game development because now with experience as a game developer, it's sort of changed the way that I play games. Um, because now, instead of just playing a game, I'm constantly analyzing the games that I'm playing, which is a little bit not as relaxing <laughs> as it used to be. Um, so I I don't know. To some extent, I, I just play video games. I watch people play video games. <laughs> As we all do. Uh, so other than that, not much. So Scott, let me put, let me put a, like a a a, a twist or or not a twist a, an addendum or what have you to that question. Then, um, so in your case, you know, if if you know video games is your hobby, is what you do most of the time, which is perfectly fine. Um, what what kind of games like what are you playing now what kind what game are you playing now and what kind of game are you enjoying now um right now oh one thing i should say is that i specifically play games off the computer i from working on games on the computer it's really made me have to play them off the computer in order to, for them to not be they not feel like work because I come to the computer and I work at the computer and then I go over to the couch and I play games for relaxing on the couch. So I pretty much exclusively play console games now, um, which is a problem because a lot of indie games are just on PC, which is why I'm really glad I finally got a Steam Deck. Um, but currently, currently I'm I've been playing the new God of War, which is fun uh i have thoughts about it that i won't get into right now i've also been playing the new pokemon game which is also fun but i also have a lot of thoughts about <laughs> uh but the the type of game that i usually play to unwind is typically something more like the new pokemon which is something where you just turn it on and you just play it for a while until you aren't playing it anymore. Um, when it's a game that's like, I don't know, like Uncharted or something, 
it's kind of hard to 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 actually commit to that like something that's like a short term singular experience is great but also very ephemeral to an extent i really like something like breath of the wild or the new pokemon game or even I've been playing a lot of Vampire Survivors, where it's just a game where you play a game while you're playing the game. Like, which, to an, which you would think would be every game, but it's not these days, is it? No, like, I was actually just thinking to myself that uh, that what I what I have been craving is uh, is like a where things are going which is a more narrative ex something what scott is asking for is something that you could put in an arcade cabinet uh whereas i am feeling like i i almost want to play a storybook like i i want uh an overarching goal and then little goals in between which is a lot like what gator game is by the way but uh... <laughs> You know, and that's that's very fair. And, um, you know, Scott, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Like, I spoke with someone that referred to Vampire Survivor as, like, sugar. Like, you just sort of, you play it, you get your hit, and then you can move on for a bit, or you can go back to it. Kind of like you're getting your sugar hit. And I I loved the way that they described, um, not, not Vampire Survivor, and I played Vampire Survivor. It's perfectly fine. I enjoy it for what it is. But the... The idea that some games can just be sugar, something you can just pick up, play, and enjoy. And, um, you know, they, Connor, what you said, like, they're, they're kind of like the arcade kind of games. And I think that's mm -hmm. perfectly valid because, you know, yeah. sometimes you just want a short hit. You just want to play a little game that the moment to moment is quick. It's easy. You can be in and out if you want, or you can spend a little more time or what have you. Um, so yeah, no, I think you know that's perfectly perfectly valid, and it's it's. Um, I don't know why I'm saying perfectly valid as if you're seeking validation from me for it, but um, <laughs> I think as a general sense, saying to like just you know th those types of games, because I know um, there are some people like there's always the argument of you know what makes a gamer or what what um, or if a game needs to be like forty hours versus. 30 minutes or or what have you what have you like all of that nonsensical rabble rousing discourse um and i think like what i'm really getting to is like the in general you know the it's perfectly valid to like what you like and if what you like is something that's just going to give you a quick punch something that's going to like make you enjoy yourself and be easy to put down or walk away from or play in chunks and you don't have to you know you don't have to exhaust yourself um playing and you know i there are some games where and you know scott you this might might hit home with you i don't know but like i've definitely played games where it's a perfectly fine game it's a perfectly enjoyable game but it's exhausting because like you have to be on you have to be there for it and you know you don't you don't always want that kind of game and like for me personally i've not i've never played um the last of us part two um, oh God! Exactly. Exactly. I think Scott. I think you. I think you. Um, I think you know your exasperation there. You know, is probably the reason that I don't want to play it. And it's that it's from what I've seen, what I've heard, whatever, whatever, whatever. That is a game that you are. You have to be present for, and you know, depending on the events that are happening, that could be an exhausting experience. And sometimes you just don't need or you don't want that and you know it's I, I think it's perfectly valid to ignore or speak against the discourse that says no you know uh games need to be x need to be y need to be z that's stupid and gatekeeping um so yeah so sorry i wasn't i ra rambled there a little bit um that wasn't meant to for me trying to say you know you're validated just more as a concept in general for people that it's perfectly valid to not feel you need to play like a, an 80 hour game that or whatever that whatever requires you, you to be yeah exactly play whatever the heck you want um especially play a little gator game i think it's gonna be great i'm i'm excited for it 
I'm looking um, through my Steam library right now, and I'm remembering. I'm I'm remembering a, a complex answer to your question, which is when I've I've opened things, I've opened this up, and the last games that I've interacted with that have stuck with me are Disco Elysium. Mm -hmm. Uh, where are the other ones? Disco Elysium, Outer Wilds, Oxen Free, um. These these games that satisfy my desire to sit down and and do like one thing for a while and and be engaged in one story, but man, those games are sad. <laughs> they they're <laughs> they're sad and scary, and that's not a criticism. That is simply a truth. Uh, I'm I'm looking at like, and, and then you have another side of the coin. You have games like. Uh, just in my library, Back for Blood, Lethal League, Going Under, games that either ask you to be on point in like a difficulty sense or a competitive sense. And I have so few games in this library that are... And the, like, uh, just to shout out some more great ones, uh, Later Alligator is, a, is an easy game that has a nice story. It's uh, it's indie, so it's not like triple A length or anything. And the animation but... is all done by Small Boo, famous Small from Boo. Batman Spider Man. Yeah. Oh, oh, right, 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 right. Yes, thank you. I I forgot about that, and then the moment you mentioned it, I immediately mm -hmm. remembered that that is why um, my significant other actually, well, one of the main reasons she actually bought that game because of Batman Spider Man. <laughs> I... And just Batman the... Spider Man. Spider Man, sorry, Spider Man. Batman and Spider Man. It was a very good game. Um, and I, I have nothing bad to say about it. Currently, in my every time I click into my Steam library, I see stories that I've already seen, right? So I, I could rehash a story if I want. Games that ask a lot of me in terms of like difficulty. And when I'm just chilling trying to do something i get i get um like not sad's not the right word i get antsy when i start playing a game and i realize that it's sugar i i get antsy when i realize that i'm doing something that's buzzing my brain but not actually accomplishing anything and like uh, to maybe may I'm psychoanalyzing myself now, but <laughs> what I've said before made me excited about games was seeing new and crazy ideas and then borrowing them and, and changing them in my head. And when I play these games that are just like buzzing the, the, um, the sugar part of my brain, but not uh, dropping off any meat. I I recognize it, and if and I by the way I think Gator Game fills this niche, the niche of an experience that. And I'm gonna interrupt myself again. We didn't we didn't know if this was gonna be a very long game, but so far it's turning out to give more hours of entertainment than we expected. But. Um, this idea of a game that goes on for a long time and you have lots of things to do and there's not very much resistance or, to doing them. You know, the, the game wants you to succeed and it's fun every time you succeed. Uh, that's, that's something that I'm aching for right now. And I've been getting that out of people giving me recommendations for things they like, especially shows. Shows ask absolutely nothing of you. Um, which makes me even like they've got to be a good show because otherwise that little part of my brain speaks up. That's like, why are you watching this? Uh, that's the end of that. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm going back. I don't know that Vampire Survivors is sugar. It Please actually defend Vampire has, Survivors right now. It actually had like I get that same feeling that I was talking about with Shovel Knight, that I'm having a conversation with the developers by playing Vampire Survivors, like, on its face. 
it is a very uh, simple game. And generally it is, but as you progress through it, the game is constantly like, okay, this thing you took for granted. What if that was different? What if we added this new thing that sort of changes how you approach this mechanic of the game? Like, as it goes, it's almost like an incremental game where it's adding complexity over time, which sort of makes you reevaluate the way that you play the game every time something changes. So I don't know that it is sugar because I think I also have a little bit of a problem. Like, I mm, I was really looking forward to Slime Rancher 2. Mm-hmm. And to be fair, it is in early access. And one, the game is gorgeous. Two, uh, the general gist of it works very well. But as I continued to play it, I very quickly realized, like, oh, there's there's not much here. <laughs> Like, I could sit here and farm things and keep making money and keep, you know, farming more slimes, but nothing was changing, and so I just kind of lost interest. Like, I I lose interest in a game if it doesn't actually reveal something new to me. Yeah, I think that's... It's maybe derogatory. And I, I, when I agreed, I never meant for it to be. But the uh, when I think of sugar, I'm not thinking of like a pile of sugar on a table. I'm thinking of the way I eat sugar, which is, oh, I want some ice cream. I want it to have like a Reese's cup in it. And then later when I want sugar again, I might have like a soda. It's, it's different every time. And every time it satisfies, it keeps satisfying, right? It, you, you, it doesn't fill you up very much. You don't get very full off of it. So you can keep taking on sugar and keep scratching that itch. And yeah, eventually you're going to be like, oh, that's enough sugar and put it down. But you will go back and you will buy another candy bar the next day. That's I still find this to be a very unfavorable comparison. All right, well, fine. <laughs> you think of a comparison and then we'll use that instead. Um, but, you know, I I think I understand what you're trying to say, Connor. And I, I agree. And Scott, I'm not trying to, like, you know, start an argument or whatever. But I think the 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 prospect of if sugar is agrees with you, Scott. How do you feel about <laughs> that? Uh, I think the prospect of like a game being like sugar is kind of like you can only define what sugar is to you. Right. Like, um, you know, I might like chocolate. You might like peanut butter. And, you know, we might we don't you know, we might not like the same things but at the end of the day the the concept of what is sugar and what isn't sugar i think is like uniquely defined to us in what's going to give us that hit um now you know in your case vampire survivor might not be sugar and that's perfectly fine um you know but in the same way something like um uh let's say ski free Wow, going real, way back there in my head. Um, ski free might be sugar for someone just because it 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 checks those boxes and hits them. Or you know, Kirby might be sugar for someone, but at the same time, Kirby might not be sugar for someone because it's for them it represents something very different, right? So um, I don't I don't think it's. I'm trying to choose my words properly here because I don't want. I'm not trying to like say I'm, I'm trying to shut down you know the conversation on that, but I just I don't think um, similar in the way that like the argument of what you enjoy. I don't think it's a safe thing to try and discuss or argue what is or isn't sugar just because it's something that's deeply personal, um, or it can maybe it's not deeply personal, but it's like it's one of those things that like. You know, only only really you can define it. And, you know, I don't think uh, not to say that's what's happening right now, but just in general, I don't think having someone try and like tell you, oh, no, this is what sugar is. This is how, you know, you know, this game is definitely sugar, like trying to put those metrics on it, I think is probably going to do more harm to you than good, because then you're going to end up potentially overanalyzing and then maybe not even enjoy what actually is your sugar, because you know, now you're seeing it in a new light. And, you know, you touched on when you play games now, you overanalyze them. Um, and like me personally, um, there was, um, I just 
I, I can't ever remember the, per the, the video of the person that made this video, but they were like touching on games like uh, Skyrim or Fallout um, and how the question they always ask, you know, if the world feels lived in, how they eat. And like, because of that, I now, when I play like, you know, immersive Sims or open world games like that, if I don't see how someone eats, I am judging the thought process that went into it or like um you know like or like the movie tropes when the more you learn about the movie sins and i or or um i shouldn't say movie sins because that's a youtube thing but like the more you learn about like tropes and cliches and stuff the more you start to like pick them out and the more that hampers your enjoyment um so like i'm i i'm not like i said i'm not trying to like attack the view of of defining sugar but i'm just meaning you know, I think it's probably one of those things where you're just going to do yourself more harm than good if you try and overly define it instead of just kind of going, oh, piece of candy, oh, piece of candy, oh, piece of candy. And, you know, that piece of candy might be uh, a Snickers bar right now or might be a cherry Coke at the next time and might be like a slice of pie the next time after that or what have you, right? Like it's, sorry, I'm not, I'm not trying to attack you. It's just, um... We can um, do the next thing. <laughs> Sorry, what, Connor? I, 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 I said, I said we, we can, we like, you're, yeah. It's let me, this has been a convert. Oh, sorry, sorry. Let God, me, like, let me just clear the air here a little bit. <laughs> Instead of framing this as like sugar or not sugar, I think mm -hmm. the better way to to characterize, at least in my head, the types of games that I actually enjoy to play, is whether they're interesting. Like, is this game making interesting choices? Is this game... Yeah. Not necessarily that it's making me make interesting choices, but is this game... Is the design of this game or the way this game is put together interesting? Like, you look at something like Outer Wilds, which is very, very deeply interesting on pretty much every level of its creation. Yeah. Or you look at Breath of the Wild, which takes the typical open world uh, game structure and shifts everything around in a really interesting way that kind of no other game had done at the time. And I don't think any game has really done the same since either. Or, or even something on its face, very simple, like Vampire Survivors, uh, which... Yeah, I would, I would find it very interesting and love it, and that's why I cannot play it. Or, I mentioned before that I've had this, this, uh, that since becoming a game developer, it's become harder to play games because I'm, I analyze them a lot more. And for no other games, is that more true than, than action adventure indie games like the one we're making? Mm. It, it becomes very difficult for me to play games that are similar to ours because it's just, for better or worse, I know I shouldn't, but like in my head, I'm constantly just comparing their choices to my choices in my game. Mm -hmm. But, um, but recently there was actually an exception to that rule, which was Tunic. Tunic had such interesting decisions in it that i it fully elevated itself out of that sort of zone into like oh i could never make this game oh <laughs> i could never make this game it's way too complicated and has and has way too many crazy s uh, swings that it's doing that it's really, really cool and has so many interesting decisions that went into the development of it. All right, Red Tunic listeners, that's what you have to look forward to. Two games from now, when Mega Wobble is still going strong. I just said I could podcast. never make that game. Scott will be an empty husk that has made everything and will not be able to enjoy any video game on the planet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I say we can make that game, probably, or something. That's also very interesting. 
and I think that Little Gator was a pretty gosh darn good first step towards that uh, that goal that shall destroy us. <laughs> so <laughs> that does. <laughs> Sorry, uh, not to try and doomsay about you know moving towards the what comes after Little Gator. You know, I do want you guys to focus on little gator first before you find the stepping stones that will destroy you guys <laughs> um and with that as well i don't i don't want to take up too much more of your time guys i don't want to keep you too long i know before we started um you know it was getting near dinner time and now it probably is pushing dinner time for you guys um so i don't want to take up too much more of your time i want to let you guys get on if your evening have some downtime um or or you know, more little gator working time, whatever you choose to do. Um, but, you know, before I before I let you go, you know, if there was anything else you guys wanted to, to throw out there, like a cool game, um, another a last pitch for a little gator, which, you know, I, I think is a fantastic game, easy pitch to make, in my opinion, um, or something you just feel more people to be aware of, I want to give you guys the floor. Oh, right on. Uh, okay, let me think about what we've already said. I can do a call to action for Gator Game. Yeah, do a call to action. If you've got <laughs> one lined up, go for it. I don't have one lined up. I'll just do it off the cuff. Oh, well, all right, cool. I mean, if you like games like Breath of the Wild, but you want it to be smaller, uh, easier digestible, and sillier, then Gator Game is coming out uh, December 14th on Steam and Nintendo Switch. If you're a parent and you don't have time for an 80-hour experience, if you're <laughs> someone who knows a child who like is old enough for video games, but uh, I, you're worried about all the violence in movies and other stuff on TV, then uh, this is a a rated E for everyone, maybe E10 with like cartoon ragdolling off cliff type stuff. But th this is a game that's meant for uh, a younger audience to enjoy as well. And if you're somebody like Scott says, who's just here to chill, we think that you will laugh, cry and uh, have all sorts of other fancy emotions about it. And you know that's that's great to hear. And like, you know, as as I've said many times before, when trying when when playing the demo, you know, I, it it was absolutely fantastic. And I'm looking forward to getting to have a much uh, wider experience with everything that you know was presented, and then some. Um, and with that is in mind as well, where can where can we learn more about you know, the game or either of you? I got all the dates in my head right now. The game is going to be out December 14th. However, you can start pre-ordering the game on December 1st. However, if you wish to pre-order on Switch in North America only, you have to wait until December 5th. Those are our dates. We also have uh, a Twitter, which has been going strong, and we're starting to branch out into Instagram and TikTok. Uh, some of the stuff there is pretty funny. I'm, I'm kind of proud of it. And that's all at Little Gator Game. At Little Gator Game, everything is at Little Gator Game, all the all the way down. And uh, and we have a Patreon. If you if you feel the urge to uh, be a part of the process of the game, we we are like just as a disclaimer, we're doing absolutely fine uh, with with uh, the support from our publisher. It is not a necessity. For you to donate in order to uh, like keep us afloat or anything, but no. if you feel like putting it out there, the option is available to you. No, the game comes out in a few weeks. The game is, I mean, the game is 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 We've wrapping made up it. development. <laughs> yeah, we, it, we th there's 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 a uh, edges to file, but we've made the video game. So that's great, and thank you guys for for you know for for joining me. I'm going to include 
you know, all of that information as well as the Patreon, you know, like you said, uh, I know you were a little hesitant on there, but that will be, all of that will be included in links. Anyone wants to follow through. Um, Cause I know you also mentioned that at some point the Patreon was going to kind of turn into a community hub as well, which is um, yes. an easy way to, to follow along, learn more, have what I'm going to assume everything kind of in one easy place, which is, you know, nice and great. Yeah. We actually, uh, now that you mention it, um, Lots of people are looking forward to speedrunning Little Gator Game, and I, I've specifically been asked, and, and lots of lots of Twitter DMs are like, this is what you could do if you wanted that to happen, it, making a place for people to gather and, and post clips and, and tips, and um, there's lots of, yeah, this isn't something that was present in the demo either, there's lots of tools uh, that Scott put in the game to um, make it easier to keep track of like the times you get on little races or i think some of them are climbing challenges as well uh, so we, we we expect a robust community on that front and if you are not really interested in speed running but you maybe you want to talk to some people about cute animals or or just stay in touch with a, a close-knit community we hope there's something for you there too Awesome. Yeah. So definitely going to include that. And hopefully, hopefully people can find that community and, you know, enjoy themselves with it. Now, if there wasn't anything else, I am going to let you guys get on if you're evening, let you guys get on to dinner. I know I kept you a little longer um, than we had intended to. So I do apologize, but I do thank you for your patience with me, especially joining me for the first um, dual interview, Woo! you know, what have you. Um, but yeah, if there was nothing else, I will let you guys get on if you're evening and go and eat put some food in your stomachs or what have you good night red tunic podcast Woo! Woo! well thank you connor for your your much uh your huge uh enthusiasm i really appreciate it scott uh, as well thank you for 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 being here for you know for for joining us for thank you for having me so yeah, thanks again to both Scott and Connor for making time to have this conversation with me. And thank you for joining us on the Red Tunic podcast, as well as a special thanks to Ron Jenkins for the use of music from the title track from Road Steep. And if you like this podcast and want to support and help it grow, please subscribe or follow me on Twitter at Red Tunic Podcast to receive the latest episodes and news. And be sure to share it with those you think might also enjoy it. Thanks until next time. <laughs>